Welcome to the National Political Debates, brought to you by the Jamaica Debates Commission, in association with Jamaica Public Service Company Limited, changing lives with their energy, and the DNG Foundation, here for Jamaicans, here for Jamaica. Tonight, we focus on socioeconomic issues. Our moderator is Archibald Gordon. Good evening. Welcome to the first of three political debates organized by the Jamaica Debates Commission, staged before a live studio audience. The debates are intended to assist in identifying, clarifying, and understanding the issues being presented in this general election campaign. This evening's debate focuses on socioeconomic issues and is in the form of a team debate. As is customary in debate production, the audience is prohibited from applauding the debaters, except for no, after we introduce each team. Our two teams tonight are for the People's National Party, Dr. Dayton Campbell. <laughs> Miss Lisa Hanna. and Mr. Raymond Price. <laughs> For the Jamaica Labour Party, Mrs. Marlene Malahu Fort. <laughs> Mr. Warren Newby. <laughs> and Dr. Sophia Longmore. Members of the panel of questioners are Ingrid Brown of the Jamaica Observer, Garfield Burford of CVM Television, and Nadine McLeod of the RGR News Center. I am your moderator, Archibald Gordon. The guidelines for tonight's debates have been previously agreed and are posted on the Debate Commission's website. That's www.jamaicadebatescommission.org. The guidelines include questions being no longer than 30 seconds and each team being allowed 60 seconds to respond to each question. Rebuttals are limited to 45 seconds. The questions posed in tonight's debate are created solely by the panel of journalists and are not influenced by the Jamaica Debates Commission in any way. Arising from a coin toss earlier, Team JLP will go first in their opening statement, while Team PNP will make the final statement at the end of the debate. And now, the two-minute opening statement from Team JLP. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, Esteemed commissioners, distinguished panelists, my worthy opponents, fellow Jamaicans, we share a fervent desire to create a society that is just, safe, and enabling, allowing every youth, young Jamaican, the opportunity to attain their full potential. This has driven our desire and our firm commitment to make easier access to education, access to health care, access to capital, and to free our society of crime and violence. I believe, and certainly do most Jamaicans, that the JLP represents the best hope for Jamaica at this time. Our Prime Minister has demonstrated not only in his words, but also in his actions, a resolution to rid Jamaica of corruption, to create a transparent and accessible government. These are the tenets under which we come to seek your support for a second term. We say to you, the Jamaica Labour Party is the party of hope, helping our people to excellence. We salute our workers. We salute the artisans, the professionals. We salute the diaspora. And we encourage all to join us in this bid 
to make a better, safer, and more prosperous Jamaica land we love. Thank you, Mr. Newby. Let us now hear Team PNP's two-minute opening statement. Good evening, everyone. On December 29, Jamaicans will go to the polls to elect a better team to lead them in the future for the next five years for a better quality of life. Raymond, Dayton, and I represent Team PMP, a team that has youth, fresh thinking, experience, and a team that comes to you with management capabilities and leadership capabilities. Dayton, having been the president of the Medical Doctors Association, and Raymond, being the former director of the Communica Commission for Consumer Affairs, and I being member of parliament for Southeast St. Anne, and certainly regional chairman. The PMP has a strong track record of social and economic policies. We've seen it with the NHT, we've seen it with the National Health Fund, we've seen it certainly in the kinds of development we've done with land reform. We've also seen it in the way we build out our infrastructure, our road networks, the expansion of our airports, certainly the expansion of our highways. And all Jamaicans can be proud of the kind of work that we have done for the majority of our country. What we believe in is people power equal access, equal prosperity, equal equity for all Jamaicans. That is what you will be voting for if you vote for the PNP versus big money power if you vote for the JLP. The JLP had promised economic growth. Instead, we had 14 consecutive quarters of economic decline. They promised jobs. We've lost over 90,000 jobs over the past four years. They've promised to eliminate waste and corruption and we've had the most glaring instances of waste and corruption, most recently the JD project. Ladies and gentlemen, if it is that you're better off today than you were four years ago, then the time has come. If you are worse off, then you must vote PMP. Thank you. Thank you, Team PNP. Our first question tonight comes from Ingrid Brown from the Jamaica Observer, and it will be directed to Team JLP. In light of the many complaints about the effect of the free healthcare policy on the quality of service available at public health institu institutions, and given Jamaica's financial constraints, why would you support a continuation of this policy? And what plans do you have to fund it for all users when there are some who can afford to pay? Now that's a very good question indeed because it cuts to the heart of many Jamaicans. The free user access to healthcare that we, the the JLP administration has implemented, has been truly a successful venture. There are those who will contend this. However, empirical data implicates that 88% from a 47 billion spent on healthcare usage back in 2007 to 94 billion, I think, let me correct that, but it's 88% increase and the usage of the healthcare services has been accessed by Jamaican people. In addition to that, we have had increased user fees, increased user usage, sorry, of pharmaceutical industries, and not just by writing prescriptions, but also the dispensation of medications. And this has seen a 71% 70, increase in the satisfaction rate of the users of these services. No. Thank you, Team JLP. Let's get a rebuttal from Team PNP. The health sector is in crisis. We have crisis in relation to human resource, where we have a migration rate of 8% annually of nurses. We have a pharmaceutical society where they have 156 positions for pharmacists and only 45 being filled. We have a crisis in relation to the infrastructure and the equipment, where you can't have basic diagnostic um, equipment available. We have a crisis when it comes to pharmaceuticals, where you have a debt, where you currently are owing about $3 billion. So we are saying as the PNP that we are coming to the table and we are going to engage our stakeholders because that is how you develop policy. We are going to go in and we are going to engage from the porters, the Thank water you, assistants team and the PNP. nurses. Let us move on to question number two by Garfield Burford. It will be posed to team PNP. What is your most radical approach to dealing with the issue of unattached youth, given the significant numbers we have in the society? The most radical approach. The truth is that youth face a very serious challenge in Jamaica at this time. When we look at the statistics, close to 75% of all crime committed in this country is committed by persons who are under 30 years old. 
We also have 55% of persons leaving high school without having passed one exam subject, and 70% of our young people are not skilled to even be employable. What we will do is that we have to stem that tide. We have to make young people employable through training, and we plan to upgrade certainly the primary school and basic school um, training facilities by identifying the 200 underperforming primary schools and basic schools to upgrade them. And we also plan to go and give them job opportunities in the areas of information and communications technology. We plan to do it in agribusiness, and we plan to do it in construction. So when you see a People's National Party government on the move, we'll build our parish youth teams for construction, we'll have farmsteads for farmers in the short run, and certainly we'll put them in telecommunications call centers as Thank well. Thank you, Team P PNP. We'll now have a 45-second rebuttal from Team JLP. I want to thank uh, my opponent for her endorsement of the CAP program. Under Prime Minister Holness, he has taken unattached youth and placed them into programs that enable them to be more, to, to, to acquire vocational skills, to be numerate, to be literate, and to acquire the soft skills in terms of deportment, in terms of conduct, in terms of discipline that will make them more productive citizens and qualify them for the workforce. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Newby. Mr. Garfield Burford from CVM TV has indicated that he would like a follow-up question. Uh, right. In the context of uh, tight fiscal constraints, uh, how would this be funded in terms of in improving the quality and up upgrading primary and basic schools? Well, the first thing that the PMB believes in is, is economic growth, and we have our plan for economic growth. But secondly, just in the same way that there were no new funds when the government embarked on the CDF program, we plan to adequately reallocate public sector funding that is, that's already available to make sure that we put it in the right place for the construction parish build youth teams, for the farmsteads where we will give young people five to 10 acres of land. I want to say to the senator that unfortunately the CAP program is not working. Over 60% of the NYS budget was cut, and we've also seen a reduction since 2007 in the hard figures, where we've dropped in enrollment from over 5,000 to a little over 1,000. So he needs to check his figures accurately. We'll now have a rebuttal from Team JLP. Well, the figures for Hard Trust NTA prior to now were greatly over-exaggerated because they were counting units done uh, by students rather than persons who had been enrolled into the program. So for each unit, it would be recorded that a person has completed certification, when in fact, if a person did welding and went on to do uh, mathematics, they would be counted two times instead of one. We took a policy decision to discontinue this practice, and we are proud to say that since 1994... Thank you very uh, much. Mr. Newby, we will move on to our question. The next question is from Nadine McLeod. It will be posed to team JLP. Yes, should the existing age of consent be maintained and why? Could you repeat the question, please? Should the existing age of consent be maintained Which and why? Which is age 16. Yes, correct. Um, I, I was just making sure I had your question correctly. Mm -hmm. um, that is a question that relates to the socio-developmental issues of a young woman at that age and stage and also young men also but I focus on women because at that age they're the ones who are most vulnerable for the negative consequences of early sexual um, involvement age 16 at that age a child is a child is at this, this stage of intimacy versus no identity versus confusion they're trying to find who they are literally a teenager at that age is trying to find who they are they're trying to figure out where they fit in society. Their greatest influences at that age is their peer influence, because that is where their interactions determine where they will go in life. And as such, if you lower, if you lower the age of consent, you're putting them at risk for even wrong decisions that could lead to very, very serious consequences later on. It is a very- Thank you very much, Dr. Longmore. Let's move on to a rebuttal from Team PNP. Uh, not so much of a rebuttal, but a uh, better redress of the question that has been posed. The issue of the age of consent is really about the initiation of sexual activity. 
the age of consent makes a distinction between what is considered statutory rape versus what is consensual sex. I think the most important area to focus our attention is to ensure that adequate information, resources, and uh, skills which will allow people, young adults, to come to decisions that are in keeping with their better outcome later on in life is what is to be supplied. We need to go back to the long-held view from the Western African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. More members of the national Thank you very family much, at the Mr. community Price. level need to be able to, to do that. Next question is Ingrid Brown to team uh, PNP. If the PNP is elected to office, will it immediately reverse the no user fee policy? And if yes, how will it ease the health care cost burden on the poor? The PNP will not immediately reverse the no user policy. What we're saying is that we agree that health care delivery shouldn't be based on finances. We agree with that. And I want to remind Jamaica that it was the People's National Party on May 27, 2007 that first removed user fees for, age, for children ages 0 to 18. That was done by Portia Simpson Miller. Now what we're saying is that we want to engage our stakeholders. We want to bring them to the table and say, we want to sit down and determine what is the minimum standard, standard of care that we can afford to give. So that's the first thing, consultative governance. The second thing that we want to bring to the table is a focus on primary health care. If you focus on primary health care, you automatically address 80% of the needs of the population. When you have a third of the persons who are diabetic not knowing, and 80% of them who are hypertensive not controlled, then primary health care must be the focus. We also want to look at mobile health care, refurbishing of the health centers, 340 to Thank benefit over 700 communities. Thank you very much, Dr. Campbell. Moving on now to a response from a rebuttal from Team JLP. I'm glad that um, Dr. Campbell has recognized that an immediate reversal would not be a wise move. Um, indeed, there is no empirical data. Actually, a World Bank study done reflects that the removal of user fees and the implication of, of, of payment at, at, at healthcare facilities actually re reduces the usage by persons who are supposed to benefit from it. Only 12% of persons of the low-income category actually get to access user fees, get to access healthcare, sorry, when you have um, impl implemented user fees. Regarding the primary healthcare um, center development, we have actually, our administration has actually embarked on that, spending over $500 million improving hospitals since our administration has taken office throughout Jamaica, the Mandeville Regional Thank Hospital. Thank you very much, Dr. Longmore. We'll move on to the next question. It's from Garfield Burford to Team JLP. To quote a sentence from your manifesto in 2007, the JLP said, our youth must be at the center of our development. How then do you square that or reconcile that with a cut in the supplementary budget in education and youth to the tune of an aggregate of about 165 million earlier this year? Well, the very first thing is that we must approach youth from the perspective of youth being streaming. The budget of education and youth do not reflect the entire spend on youth because health, national security, industrial and commerce, and all other ministries have agencies and programs under their mandate that are directly related to our youth. Beyond that, we have engaged the donor, international donor community to augment um, and support our, our, our budget in education and youth. Thank you very much, Mr. Newby. Let's get a rebuttal from Team PNP. Well, if, if that is what the JLP has to come with, it really has abandoned youth, because in the Ministry of Youth and Culture, of the $1.9 billion in recurrent expenditure, only $83 million is actually spent. It needs to be a reversal in terms of how we look at the majority of our population. What is most interesting with the JLP as well, if you look through the budget, the most significant increase towards any kind of spend is towards juvenile centers. And they've increased that to over $500 million to $800 million. They're spending more money to lock up young people than they are to train them. We now have a follow-up question. Mr. Burford has indicated that he'll have a follow-up question. Just a reminder that uh, each journalist is allowed two follow-up questions during the uh, entire debate. The, of the aggregate 165 million, uh, this was the second time since the budget cut this year that there was a deferral of uh, the building of youth information centers. There was actually a deferral from last year as well. How would this, wouldn't this uh, adversely impact on youth? Uh, Mr. Burford, 
uh, the contracts for the two centers that were deferred are to be signed shortly. Cabinet recently approved those for Spanish Town and for Maypen in Clarendon. What happened was that the land acquisition process and the approval process was uh, delaying the, 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 the other approvals that, that, that uh, run concurrently. And, and as such, we had to take a decision to delay the implementation until later on in the year. We are proud, though, to say that when we came to office, there were only four youth information centers. Today, there are nine. Thank you very much, Mr. Newby. We will have a rebuttal from Team PNP. You know, it is no wonder why they say pride goeth before a fall, that Mr. Newby is proud of that record. I think he should revert to his State of the Nation address of three years ago when he indicated a specific, measurable, time-bound objective that there would have been by now at least 14 youth information centers. He didn't speak then about land acquisition issues, so I think he needs to check his own record and see where the reversals really are. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Price. Let's move on to the next question. It's from Nadine McLeod, <laughs> and it goes to Team PNP. There are about 50,000 young people who are unemployed, according to the Economic and Social Survey report of 2010. What workable plan does your party have for them? Thank you. The People's National Party has several plans in the work. Certainly the first is to get the economy growing because over the last three years we've seen 14 consecutive quarters of economic decline. We have an emergency program to not only kickstart the economy but certainly to face the crippling levels of poverty that have doubled under the Jamaica Labour Party. One of the things that we'll be doing is be providing farmlands for youth in agriculture to have farmsteads so that they'll have irrigation and provide um, suitable agricultural products for agribusiness. We'll also give youth in construction internship and work by putting together parish build teams to fix indigent housing, certainly roads, gullies, bridges, etc. And we'll also go into ICTs and the creative industries where young people are very, very talented. Even in our prisons, some of the best music comes out of our prisons in Jamaica. But we will be actually giving them grants to go into these areas so that they can Thank have you very much, Ms. Hannah. Let's have a rebuttal from uh, Team JLP. Yeah. The PNP believes that it is the role of the state to create jobs. We strongly disagree. We believe in a private sector-led approach, and this is why, despite the global recession, we have undertaken the most comprehensive reform package to free capital, to enable ideas and capital to meet at a point that will drive job creation. We have not had the sort of success that we imagined, but the constraints that are structural and others that are international crippled our efforts. Despite that, however, we created 67,000 jobs over the last couple of years. Thank you very much, Mr. Newby. We'll move on to the next question. It's from Ingrid Brown, and it goes to Team JLP. Jamaica's main city, Kingston, is overrun with inner cities, many without proper infrastructure. How do you propose to tackle the problem of urban blight to help improve the future of young people in some of these communities? Well, the tackle of urban blight is, is a very challenging one, not only shared in Jamaica, but uh, uh, the world over. However, one of the findings that we have seen is that rural Jamaica is grossly underpopulated. It is, gr that is where 70% of the p poverty of Jamaica exists. If there are ways that we can collaborate a fusion between urban development and rural development, I think there needs to be that level of, of, of um, care towards rural development to enable and enhance resources in the urban city, in the urban um, areas. You have to catch these unattached youths that are usually on the streets. We have plans in place. The Community Renewal Program is a, is a program that has been put in place by the JLP that has been rolled out since October of this year and is operating in the primary primary crime-ridden areas of, of, of the country. Kingston, St. Andrew, St. Catherine, St. James, Clarendon are parishes that this pro program has actually started in. Thank this you very much, Dr. Longmore. Let's move on to the next, uh, well, first, the rebuttal from Team PNP. The example, much known example in South St. Andrew applies, where with existing resources and vision, 
there can be a better coordinated approach to bring resources in terms of financial resources and activities to, for the numbers of young persons to get additional education and training that can be then reinvested in the communities. I want to also touch on another area. The proponents, the Jamaica Labour Party, speak of their record. Perhaps, alas, if they had wasted less money on the JDIP, for instance, in the Christiana Road to Nowhere that is still unfinished but well over budget, then some of that billion dollars could have been applied to convert more of our inner cities into winner cities by Thank putting the resources much, where Price. they're most needed. We will now take a short break and we invite you to stay tuned. The smiles on their faces mean more than just happiness. Since 2002, the JPS Early Childhood Nutrition Program has been supporting thousands of children across the island. The program now feeds 30,000 basic school students every day. With good nourishment, they are eager and able to learn. The JPS has links to communities that go well beyond wires and poles. Here, with a little help from JPS, early childhood students are getting a chance to shine. Now this one is called All About Music. Fulfilling hopes, creating dreams, and making a difference are at the heart of the Denny and Gettys Foundation. Through our Diageo Learning for Life skills training programs, over 1,800 Jamaicans now have a real chance of contributing to Jamaica's economic growth. One being accepted, we learn a lot of things. Before, I thought I was just going to come and mix up some drinks and flip some bottles and stuff. But before we got to that, the meat of the matter, I learned personal development, working with colleagues and customers, communicating on the telephone, instead of saying, hello, who is this? Certified as bartenders, drapery makers, plumbers, tilers, waiters, housekeepers, customer service agents, and landscapers, Diageo Learning for Life graduates are empowered, competent, and able to give back to their families, communities, and Jamaica. The Daniel and Gettys Foundation, here for Jamaicans, here for Jamaica. Hey, it's all about the music. Go out and vote for who we want to vote for and respect each other. Can't go every day a kill off one another, so we need love. Violence just mash up Jamaica. Even the devil vex my right, brother. We are all one Jamaican. We want peace and we want to know to read in one another. We'll just give things violence free. So please, peace all the way. Crime free election, and that may I ask for. Share a direct unified love with each other. One nation united under God. Jamaica need love. No gun, just love. Respect. 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 The National Political Debates. Brought to you by Jamaica Debates Commission. In association with Jamaica Public Service Company Limited. Changing lives with their energy. And the DNG Foundation. Here for Jamaicans. Here for Jamaica. Welcome back to the first in a series of three political debates being facilitated by the Jamaica Debates Commission. If you're just joining us, welcome as well. We invite Garfield Burford of CVM Television to start this segment with a question for Team PNP. In the 1970s, there was perhaps the sharpest division uh, in terms of the parties on ideology, economic management between the both JLP and PNP. Since then, many persons argue that there really is no, not much of an ideological difference in terms of economic management between JLP and PNP. Do you agree with that? And one, and two, if not, can, can Jamaicans expect accelerated levels of growth, uh, much faster levels of growth than the average 1% you managed in your 18 and a half years in office? Well, the first thing is that there's a stark difference between our ideologies. The PNP actually manages the, manages the economy and the JLP does not. We actually had 13 years of the 18 years that we were in office for positive economic growth. What is also interesting is that we gave to the JLP our debt at 104%. We had reduced poverty to 9.8%, the lowest in our history. What have they done with it? They've grown the debt to one over 130%. They've lost over 90,000 jobs. They've had 14 consecutive quarters of no growth. We have managed in times of the IMF, 
and we've also had growth in that time, and we've also had record, record foreign direct investment in that time as well. The one additional point I'd like to add to that, the issue of ideologies about outcomes. The People's National Party remain focused.